people came over, you know, on the Mayflower. More than 300 years ago. <laughs> Ours is an old American family. My people came over on foot more than 20,000 years ago. Ours, well, you could say that ours is a very old American family. Who discovered America? More than 20,000 years ago, so the story goes, men from northeastern Asia found their way here. The ancestors of the American Indians. Most likely, anthropologists say, they walked across the Bering Straits from Asia. What of their life here? We must go back. It is now 500 years before the birth of Christ. A young man sits in the shade of his house, mending his net, remembering the elk he saw on the ridge this dawn silhouetted against the clear Arizona sky. In New York, a tall man tussles a fish off his hook, while the beautiful sound of a bone flute reaches him from his village. In Kentucky, a woman sorts through her basket of snail-shell beads, sifting them through her skillful brown fingers to find the perfect one to complete the decorations on her husband's shirt. And on the prairie grassland, a group of hunters move slowly, carefully, toward a huge shaggy bison grazing upwind unawares. To these Americans, the land is real. They know the soil, they name the trees and the berries and the small animals. But to others across the seas, this land is still a thing of dreams and visions. So who are the next people to discover America? There are some fables and tales about them too. Fables and tales. Well, what else is history really? For example, a small ship dips and bobs through the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Her prow, a huge carved horse's head. A square sail of brilliant purple billows stiffly before the wind. And men stand on her deck looking toward the horizon. Veiled as they are by the fog and by time and by legend, it's hard to make out what they look like. Small and slender, certainly dark, Perhaps some of them are black. These are Phoenicians, already traders by sea for a thousand years. They long ago sailed from their home on the coast of Africa through the Pillars of Hercules, later called the Straits of Gibraltar, and out into the Atlantic beyond. Even though they returned safely from these ventures, few other Mediterranean sailors followed them particularly when we tell our tales of boiling seas, huge fishes with fangs, and the great sea of darkness, an impenetrable scum of green weed. We never say where we have been or where we are going. The trade routes of the world are our secrets. They call us, rightly enough, the silent people. But if we were to tell you we have sailed to Ophir to fetch ivory and apes and peacocks for the Jewish king, sailed round Africa and saw the sun shining, not from the south, but from the north, sailed through the pillars of Hercules and then to the island of the blue people, sailed in every sea, under every kind of sky. And now we sail to the island of Ultima Thule. Oh, other ships have reached Ultima Thule, blown off course by wild winds, but we come by design to settle in the new land 
where we can worship according to our conscience. Following the old ways, the traditions. As we have always done. Since time began. According to the dictates of our gods. The needs of our gods. Our gods need the blood of men to nurture the sky and the seas and preserve the holy unity of blood and soil. Our gods need human sacrifice. And the Greek conquerors at home would deny us this. Look, look there. Is that just the horizon? Or is it a coast? An edge of land there? Soon the ship comes to rest on a rocky beach, keeling over close to the sand. Its purple sail sags and dies and is furled. The men fling hemp ropes over the side and then wade through the surf and stand on their new land. The year, 480 BC. The men, Phoenicians. The place, New Hampshire. Another tale. A ship lies a little way up a winding river. Her prow is a giant swan's head and she lies silent in the still afternoon. She looks like a great bird nesting in the reeds, rocking gently in the river's current. On shore, a band of men and women, dressed in coarse homespun robes, sit on the rocks at the river's edge. I say this place will do. Soil looks rich, fish in the river, the water's clear. And sweeter than the Tiber. The Tiber is far away now, friends. As far away as a bad dream when you waken. Yes, we can forget. Forget? You'd forget the fire and the dogs tearing our friends apart while the mob howled for more? You'd forget the slaughter? The soil is rich and there are fish in the river. We can forget. We start anew here. The year, 64 A.D. The people, Roman Christians. The place... Virginia. On the other side of the continent, a few centuries later, another legend comes in sight of land. Scudding down the Pacific coast in a giant Chinese junk, a Buddhist priest searches for the land of the painted people. He comes ashore somewhere and finds people in this land he calls Fu Sang. Were they Mayans or Peruvians? We may never know. But whoever they were, Ho Shin was not their first visitor. For he says he found five Buddhist monks there already. And then, back on the Atlantic, the Irish. A bold monk called Brother Brendan sails about having remarkable adventures like celebrating Easter Mass on the back of a whale and meeting walruses reclining on a foggy beach. But he finally finds a land full of flowers and the sweet odor of flowers. A musical land, a paradise. The year, 551. The place, Florida. These are shadowy figures on shadowy voyages. More definite in outline are the Vikings, men from Scandinavia, who show up clearly on the pages of accepted history and who regularly sailed between Europe and Iceland and Greenland. Rugged men with winged helmets and a scorn of hardship. One Viking hero, Eric the Red, exiled from Iceland for killing a man, sails to Greenland, builds a colony, and sires a son. I am Leif, son of Eric. I sailed without my father on this journey, though I begged him to lead us. But he is grown old and reluctant to face the harshness of the sea. His beard no longer flame, more frost now. So I sail with 30 men, and we have found landfalls, those guarded by snow mountains, those stretching in white sands. But now we have come to a land of wild grapevines. 
and I have therefore named the land Vinland. Here are natural wheat fields and birch and salmon larger than I have ever seen. The year 1003, the place Cape Cod. There were others of these men who may have come to America and then again may not have, like the Welsh Prince Maddock, who saw Kentucky and Missouri as early as 1171 and left a spawn of pale Welsh-speaking Indians to confound the colonists. Or the 30 men who are said to have sailed north around Labrador, west to Hudson Bay, and from there into the interior of this land. A stone was found in Minnesota on which there have been chiseled... We are eight Goths and 22 Norwegians on exploration journey north from this stone. We were out and fished one day. After we came home, found ten of our men red with blood and dead. Ave Virgo Maria, save us from evil. We have ten men by the sea to look after our ships fourteen days journey from this island. Year one, three, six, two, thirteen, sixty-two. Is this stone a forgery, fable or fact? Sorting fable from fact has undoubtedly been a problem to man since he first began to speak. Now in Italy in the thirteenth century, a man sits in a prison cell and each day tells his visitors of wonderful adventures while they try to sort the fables from the facts. They come to hear him speak of the unbelievable, of Kubla Khan. Look, uh, his cell door's open. As long as he has an audience, you couldn't chase him out of here. You're just in time. Sometimes it gets pretty crowded. That's Marco Polo in the center. Marco, Marco, tell us about Kanbalik. Yes, tell ah, us about Kanbalik. 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 City oh. of the Great Khan. Well, it was 24 miles in circumference, perfectly a square, laid out like a chessboard. Mm -hmm. There lived so many elegant people that the cloth makers had a thousand carts and oh, pack horses loaded with raw silk brought in every day. The roof of the palace was decorated in vermilion and azure and green, mm. all varnished so it gleamed in the sun. And inside, a banquet hall that could seat 6,000 guests. Oh, ah, those banquets. I am pleased, Master Marco, that you are favorably impressed. Oh, I am. She's a marvelous dancer, really super. With our paper currency, hmm? uh, as you were saying this afternoon. Oh, yes, your, your paper currency. It's uh, so much easier to carry than the heavy metal we use. Now, I've heard of a country in the West that issued notes on leather. But this is certainly superior. We Chinese have used paper money for a long time. The Great Khan was quick to see its advantage. Kublai Khan seems to respect much of your culture. Yes, we are most happy that he has forsaken his rougher Mongolian ways. Mm, to me, one of the great marvels of your culture, Li Huan, are the black stones that burn. Ah, yes. Well, we have need of a great deal of fuel. We do enjoy our hot baths. <laughs> yes, they take a baths three times a week. <gasps> and in winter, every day. Sinful. Imagine a, such a thing. In winter, every day. Not Christian. How could you bear it, Marco? <laughs> My friends, on a warmer day like today, crowded together in this little cell as we are, with only that uh, one uh, small window for air, I cannot help... Uh, 
<laughs> but think back fondly on the Chinese bathing habits. So Marco Polo tells his tales about the empire of Cathay. He means well, but you have to be careful. He's a great liar. That about black stones that burn. <laughs> if he'd just stick to his stories of the great bird that can carry off three elephants and uh, the tribe of men with tails like dogs, this one might believe. But the black stones that burn... In 1324, Marco Polo dies. Near the end of his life, a priest leans close and asks whether he wishes to confess the falsehood of some of the stories he has told. He answers, I did not tell half of what I saw, for I knew I would not be believed. So fact and fable conspire to excite the imaginations of medieval Europe, as spices and exotic goods travel across deserts and wild mountain passes and through rough seas to bear testimony to the existence of these strange lands. Stroll through a trade fair this afternoon in France and smell the cinnamon and incense, the pungent oranges a dollar apiece, the peppercorns each, each 50 cents. The gentlemen of France wander among the stalls in their sleek fur coats and velvet turbans. They move at a stately pace, since their velvet shoes have pointed toes exactly one foot long, making rapid locomotion difficult without unseemly flapping. Above the laughter and the music and the quarrels, above all, the tradesmen. Keep your meat sweet. Cloves and peppers from the Indies. This dagger from Damascus, sir. The finest delicate silver filigree, enhancing the deadliest blade on earth. Yes, milady, silk, pure silk, cloth spun by angels, all the way from the empire of Cathay. The blue, a perfect match for your eyes. Peacock feather, see the eye. The tail of the giant ostrich bird. Egret, white egret. This ring, gold brought out of Mali just last winter, my lord. Yes, from the palace of Timbuktu. Yes, my lady, silk, pure silk, cloth spun by angels all the way from Cathay. The yellow, a perfect match. For this your... is the spring festival at Beauvais. And booths line the narrow cobbled streets with their cloth and jewelry and jade and bronze. But the fair spills over into the adjacent meadow where peddlers and troopers from all over Europe display their wares and their skill. Hear ye, hear ye. Good citizens all and welcome visitors from far and near. Know you that with all good speed the play of Daniel, performed by my gifted fellow students and relating the extraordinary miracle of Daniel's deliverance by the Lord from the lion's den, will be performed without delay, just as it was first introduced in the Cathedral of Beauvais centuries ago. One day in a prince's castle in Portugal, a man from Venice spread some huge parchments out on the thick oak table of the main hall, and the gentlemen crowd around his drawings under the earnest guidance of Captain Perestrello of the prince's court. The Venetian is explaining the drawings. You see, gentlemen, these larger galleys are of much stouter construction, three masts, and at sea they rely mainly on their sails. Oars are used only for entering and leaving harbors, in a flat calm and in emergencies. Gentlemen, perhaps I could add to what our Venetian friend has said here, 
These ships are extremely dependable over long voyages, most suitable for the new voyages to the south and the east, yes, and even to the west. Ah, to the west. Though many of us have given up the idea that the Earth is flat, who dares to sail west? <laughs> Which one of you? <coughs> uh, now, gentlemen, uh, before Prince Henry's arrival, I would review his goals with you. Um, to uh, explore the coast of Africa, beyond the Canary Islands and Cape Bonhadour. To seek beyond the Cape countries for possible trade. Gentlemen, the prince arrives. His Highness, Prince Henry of the Kingdom of Portugal. Illustrious... Terestrello, we'll dispense with formality. The day and our purpose have been sharpened by some dire news. News of the gravest significance. Old friends and comrades, Constantinople has fallen. Oh, oh no! The oh. Ethan Turks have captured the city. And so, my friends, I need hardly point out that an important trade route to the east has been irreparably cut off. Our search for new trade routes must be pursued with increased vigor. Perestrello, gather together all our papers and charts and bring them to the council chamber immediately. New trade routes. A greedy Europe becomes obsessed with new trade routes. Years pass. Prince Henry dies. Captain Perestrello dies. But the interest in new trade routes continues. Who dares to sail west? Huh? Which one of you? What is it you want? Oh no. Captain Perestrello is not here. He died two years ago. I am Signora Perestreo, his grieving widow. The captain was a fine man. His papers? You mean his writings and the charts of his voyages? I gave them all to my son-in-law. He has such a great interest in geography. If you see him in town, ask about the charts. Perhaps he will show them to you. You cannot miss him. He is a tall, tall man with auburn hair. His name is Christopher Columbus. This has been another program in the series Our Nation's Heritage, produced and presented as a public service by Standard Oil Company of Texas. Who dares to sail west? Huh? Which one of you? On the wharves of Genoa, Italy, a small boy lingers by the ships, sniffs the salty wind, and squints up at the masts waving slowly against the sky. The rough wood of the wharves creaks against the tides, and he learns from these things. He watches the cargoes being unloaded from strange places, and he learns their names. He sits by the sailors themselves, looks up at their faces burnt to leather by the suns of distant skies, and he listens to them talk of the sea. They talk of Marco Polo, too, who was imprisoned right here in Genoa more than a hundred years before, and who told his stories of the great Khan and the land of spices. The small boy begins to dream large dreams. Then he listens to the sailors tell of the terrors of the unknown. should sail too far to the north. 
he will find that the sea is milky white and freezing cold it is in winter and summer. Hideous, squat little people live there with their faces at their backs so they can get away from the ravenous beasts always running after them. But what is your idea of the shape of the earth? Well, Christopher, I've sailed every sea meant to be sailed by man. Now, young people may laugh at the idea of falling off the edge of the world if you sail too far, but it makes good sense to me. Anyway, there's plenty of sailing space in the world as it I is I have heard without... that learned men have known for a long time that the Earth and the water form a single globe, and mm, that... Yes, yes, we've heard all that, too. Well, you'd better run along now, boy. Your father will be wanting you at the shop. You'll never learn the weaver's trade lolling around here. I'm not going to be a weaver. I'm going to see. Are you? And end up like the rest of us. A couple of coins at the end of the trip, serving a captain that may be the devil himself. Now, oh, boy, stay here in this nice little town and learn to be a good, steady weaver like your father. I will not be a common weaver. <laughs> You'd rather be a common seaman, then. I will not be a common seaman, either. Well, you're an unpleasant enough little boy to end up a captain, I will say that. Now run along. I will not be a weaver. I will not be a weaver. I will not be a weaver. The boy grows up and his dreams grow with him. But he is still bound to the land, working as a wool carder in Genoa. But when he is 27, somehow he pries himself loose, makes his way to Portugal, and ships out to sea. Ten years later, he turns up in Spain, trying to sell his dream. Oh, I broached the subject to the kings of Portugal and France and England all, and they responded enthusiastically with proposals for my voyage, but I rejected them all in order to enrich Spain. Now, my plan is to sail to... To the Indies by sailing west? Oh, my dear fellow, what an incredible idea. But my plan is... We're not disputing the fact that it is quite possible to sail westward, but if the world is indeed round, can't you see that after a point you would be sailing downhill and could never return? My plan is... It is, is inconceivable that this son of a Genoese weaver would find strange lands that have been hidden from all the great navigators through the thousands of years since the world began. Totally inconceivable. I insist on seeing His Majesty once again. I am sorry, but His Majesty is frightfully busy lessening the population of the African Moors. Then I must see Her Majesty the Queen. Based on the geographical facts alone, it is our recommendation that no more time be wasted on the proposal of this man, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> According to our calculations, it would take three years to reach the Indies traveling in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> Now early morning light slits between the heavy brocade curtains of the king's chamber. The night guards who slept across the threshold of his door have long since risen and stretched and gone their ways. The king sleeps peacefully, his snores muffled by the thick red curtains around his bed. But now the Lord High Chamberlain enters the room and thrusts the window curtains apart, so the light fills the chamber and he wakes the king. Ferdinand athletic, energetic, gets quickly out of bed and pulls on the silk shirt the Lord High Chamberlain holds out to him, and then he splashes his face with water from a silver basin. He's here again, sire. What is that? I said, he's here again, sire. Christopher Columbus. He's with Her Majesty right now. So early. Does that madman never sleep? Now that he is at last assured of your majesty's approval and support, his energy seems boundless. Well, we did keep him simmering seven years, that's true enough. But he knows the queen is not well and needs her rest. He seems worried about finances, but her majesty has already assured she him... She is far more patient than I would be. What she sees in him, I really cannot say. I find him 
a thoroughly irritating man, pompous, fanciful, greedy, and utterly convinced that in all things and in all ways he is right. This from a man with no education and less breeding. Well, I will sign his precious patent to please her and send him off on his mystical chase. And good riddance. Now, about the hunt, I noticed the greyhounds seem to hold back. And the queen, Isabella. What do I see in him? I see a man of great passion and vision. His eyes never seem to be looking at mundane things before him, but rather he seems to see some holy dream, some gigantic fantasy. Oh, I know he is not what one would call a reasonable man, but is it a reasonable man who dares greatly? Is it a reasonable man who would set off blindly towards an unknown horizon? No, a monarch must be reasonable. But surely a discoverer need not be. Perhaps I envy our Christopher Columbus a little. Under the terms of the patent signed by Ferdinand and Isabella, this man, obscure until so recently, is to become an admiral of the ocean sea and a titled nobleman, to be governor of the lands he discovers with all judicial power and control over trade and revenue. And he is to receive a large percentage of all profits. What does it matter what we promise him? Were he to reach Asia, which of course is most unlikely, he will be slaughtered by the first Asiatic warrior he comes across. No, promise him all that nonsense. He may find an island somewhere with a good stock of savage chickens, and he will be welcome to a tenth of those. Months of negotiations and arrangements follow. And then, toward the end of July, three small ships, the Santa Maria, the Nina, and the Pinta, are made ready for the great voyage. The boatswain's mate is supervising the stowage of supplies while the secretary sits at a small table by the gangplank. He records each load as it comes on board his goose quill pen scratching on the huge tan sheets of paper that are spread out in the sun on his table and held down from the wind by his pots of ink and pots of sand. Water, wine, oil and olives. Garlic, dried salt fish. Honey and almonds and raisins. And the basic foods, dried biscuits, chickpeas, salted meats and cheese. The navigator checks my charts, my astrolabe, compass, quadrant, sand glasses, yes, and uh, my sounding leads. I also take along my vast knowledge of the seas and tides, and my rosary. Friday, August 3rd, 1492. Half an hour before sunrise, the three ships leave Palos and proceed down the Rio Tinto to the Atlantic Ocean. By September 6th, they have cleared the Canary Islands and the order is given to sail straight west. Journal of Don Christopher Columbus, Admiral of the Ocean Sea. We departed this day in the forenoon, and I shaped a course to make my voyage. Each ship is now a world apart, a world of careful patterns, ritual, hardship, and the comfort of religion. Each dawn is sung by a boy of the Blessed duty watch. Be the light of day. And the holy cross we say And the Lord of Verity And the Holy Trinity Blessed be the immortal soul And the Lord who keeps it whole 
Blessed be the light of day, and he who sends the night away. Dawn, and then dusk, and dawn, and dusk. Early this night, we saw fall from the sky a marvelous branch of fire. A meteor flashing through the monotony of nights. Today there were mild breezes, and the savor of the morning is a great delight. The only thing lacking is the song of the nightingales. Dawn and dusk and endless green sea. Prayers and dry biscuits. Fingers grown like leather and sleep huddled against the salt-edged wind. At dawn, two or three small birds came to the ship singing and disappeared before sunrise. Toward the end of September, they think they sight land. But it is not land after all, and the voyage continues. Sea fair and calm. To God, many thanks be given. The air is very soft and mild. Many flying fish flew aboard the ship. 7th October. Blessed be the light of day. A great multitude of birds passed over. 10th October. Blessed be the light of day. My people are complaining bitterly of the long voyage. But I tell them I have come to go to the Indies and I shall continue until I have found them. With the help of our Lord. 11th October. Blessed be the light of day. We saw a little branch of dog roses floating in the sea. <sighs> By the saints. Yes, it is. Land, land! What do you say? Land there! Look you there! He's right! Look! Look, land there! So in the early light of Friday, October 12th, 1492, shining there under the morning mist, a low white beach backed by green forests. An island. Boats set out from the three ships with men carrying muskets and crossbows and banners. Columbus and his men have suffered and they have dared. They have reached land and the triumph is theirs not to be diminished. They have sailed from a Europe vibrating with violence, with crime and retribution. A Spain where robbers are executed in public by first having their feet cut off, and then their hands, and finally their heads. A Spain in which thousands of suspected heretics are burned while the Inquisition rages. How still and placid these islands must seem. We entered a river, very beautiful. I never beheld so fair a thing. Trees all along the river, beautiful and green, with flowers and fruits, each according to their kind, many birds which sing very sweetly. But he carries certain ills of his world with him, as will others who come after him. For they are all men of their particular time and their particular place. And Europe is not a gentle world. In Columbus, all the symptoms are there to see. Lust for gold, reliance on violence, and a willingness to enslave. He finds the islanders handsome and friendly, though he calls them great cowards. One day, six young men row out to the Santa Maria, and five come on board. I ordered them to be held, and I will bring them back to Spain. I sent my men to a house on the bank of the river, and they brought back seven females, some of them young, and three boys. The male captives will behave better, I believe, with some of their own women along. That night it is cold on deck, and the captives huddled together, stunned and trembling. The moonlight speckled on the sea picks up a dark shape moving out from the shore. The sound of paddles moving through the water reaches the dark deck. 
and the captives grow still, wondering. There came aboard, in a dugout, the husband of one of the women. He is the father of several of the children, and he said he wished to come with them. He begged me. Well, I agreed. They all seem happier now, though the women still weep. His lust for gold is obsessive, and it deflects his course. His ship follows the erratic magnet of rumors of gold, and he skims along the coasts of islands wherever gold beckons. These islands are very green and fertile, and the air very balmy, and there may be many things I do not know, for I do not wish to tarry here, but to discover and go to many islands to find gold. The islanders, friendly people, wanting to please, probably feed his obsession. Is there gold in this island? I do not understand. Gold. Yellow metal. Like the sun. Gold. Oh, yes, yes. Surely, what you seek must surely be there on the far island. Yes, the far island. He finds a few earrings, some nuggets. From island to island he pursues his golden dream. Without doubt, there is in these countries a tremendous quantity of gold. For not without reason, these Indians on board say that there are in these islands places where they mine gold and wear it on their necks, ears, arms and legs. Then in March, without having found the land of spices, having misjudged poor soil for fertile, having mistaken a local bark for cinnamon, having taken captives whom he says he cannot trust because they repeatedly try to escape, he sails for home. It is a triumphant entry. And the son of the weaver sits in the presence of the king and queen. His fame lights up Spain. He has opened the way to the new world and he has a right to his fame. But it rests uneasily on two misconceptions. That he has found a rich source of gold and spices and that he has reached the land of the great Khan. Well, you see, the Admiral had us all swear. I mean, that is what he did. He took us all to the notary on board ship and had us swear on pain of a hundred lashes and having our tongues slit that we had reached it, that we had reached the mainland of the great Khan. Well, there were not many of us who were willing to say otherwise, don't you see? In the years and the voyages that follow, Columbus tries to keep alive his myths, but now he is sailing downhill. I have demonstrated that there is gold in these lands and innumerable minerals, and I have brought your highnesses lapis lazuli, amber, pepper and cinnamon, sandalwood, ginger, cotton, incense, and the finest pearls. But only the cotton and pearls are genuine. In the meantime, his colony of Hispaniola is torn with rebellion and rotting with greed. Disturbing reports reach Spain at odds with the reports sent by the Admiral himself. One afternoon, a Spanish vessel appears off the coast. Commander de Bobadilla stands on the deck, leaning into the wind and peering toward the harbor of Santo Domingo. There it is, Enrique. It will be good to stand on something firm for a change, eh? Something that does not wobble and tilt beneath your feet. The land looks lovely. Yes, peaceful little harbor. Hardly fits the reports of all the strife. Well, Columbus says that all is well. His letters... Yes, his letters say a great many things. A great many things that are strange. In fact, and this is confidential, it is the strangeness of his letters that convince their majesties to send me to have a look. Look there, Francisco. There, on either side of the harbor. What are those things? Those two dark things. They look like... Yes. They look like... Yes. Gallows. Those are bodies hanging there. How still the harbor is. No one to be seen. Just those bodies. 
I can feel it now, can't you? The evil of this place. Bobadilla is so shocked at the conditions of the colony that he sends Columbus home to Spain. The Admiral of the Ocean Sea comes home in chains. When Columbus reaches Spain, he is freed by order of the King and Queen. His title is restored to him, and finally he is sent on a fourth voyage to the New World. Blessed be the light of day, and the Holy Cross we say, and the Lord of Verity, and the Holy Trinity, blessed be the immortal soul. This fourth and last voyage of Christopher Columbus is the longest and most dangerous, and he ends up stranded in Jamaica. Now an old man, sure that the world is shaped like a pear, and that he once found the Garden of Eden, he writes, When I discovered the Indies, I said they were the world's wealthiest realm. I spoke of gold, pearls, precious stones, spices, and of the markets and fairs. But, because not everything turned up at once, I was vilified. Oh, most excellent gold. Who has gold has a treasure with which he gets what he wants, imposes his will on the world, and even helps souls to paradise. <laughs> I came to serve you at the age of 28, and now I have not a hair on me that is not white, and my body is infirm and exhausted. All that is left to me has been taken away and sold, even to the cloak I wore. Now heaven have pity on me, and earth weep for me. When he finally finds his way back to Spain, Isabella is dead. Ferdinand will not now be bothered with the old man, and in 1506, Columbus dies, begging for favors that never come, alone with his grand illusions. This has been another program in the series, Our Nation's Heritage, produced and presented as a public service by Standard Oil Company of Texas.